Welcome to the podcast of MotorWeek, television's original automotive magazine. MotorWeek is made possible by TireRack.com and by RockAuto.com. Here's your MotorWeek podcast host, John Davis. And thank you, Alec Webb, and welcome everyone to MotorWeek podcast number 149. And in MotorWeek Central today, around our oddly shaped table, we have writer-producer Brian Robinson. Morning, John. Our road test producer, Ben Davis. Thank you. 149. Wow. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Assistant producer, Greg Carlos. Hey, now. And our online content coordinator and producer uh, of these podcasts, Patrick Lucas. Hello, John. OCC. Oh, OCC. Well, you know me. Yeah, Down here we go. Um, lots to talk about today. We've got cars. We've got our lightning round. Coffee. We've even got a viewer question. Rant and rave, see if somebody's got something that uh, they're just dying to get off their hairy chest. <laughs> Mid-size SUV oh, challenge they with know. our friends up at Cars.com. <laughs> Brian Robinson, you were the point person on that. How did it go? What could, did we learn from it? Anything new? Let's take it away. Uh, typical, this was strictly five-passenger SUVs. So this is two-row, not three-row. Correct. And it was pretty uh, stringent price cap so things like uh, forerunner and more off-road focused uh weren't really here it was mainly just uh crossovers uh so that meant the ford edge nissan murano hyundai santa fe sport kia sorrento and jeep grand cherokee did make it in. Did, it so, did so what was the price cap so Do you remember i believe hand? it was thirty-seven thousand. that's, that's mm-hmm. not that's so. That's right around what they call the average transaction yeah. price for all vehicles. That's kind of how they come up with those. Yeah. Uh, but like Forerunner, there's most people are closer to forty for yeah. those. So it would have been like an ultra base to get in there. But so uh, um, it's a little bit of a surprise to me. The uh, winner was the Nissan Murano. It's and not, not. I mean, I like the Murano. I think we all like it, yeah. but it because very. But it's not exactly. The biggest? It's not your typical else. family SUV, but maybe yeah. that helped it uh, win. I think everyone was just uh, blown away by the comfort of being inside of it, driving it all day. It's just like uh, super comfortable. Interior is bright and airy. Uh, nice, nice place to spend some time. Uh, and it drives nice. So, uh, What about utility? The, I mean, it's not the biggest by any stretch. It's not the biggest, but the space that's there is very useful. Uh, mm-hmm. Some of them might have bigger numbers, but uh, maybe awkwardly shaped. You're not able to use all that space. Because it's so uh, slanted. But the uh, the Edge came in second, did pretty well. It, it was pretty close between those two. Uh, edge has some really good. The Sync 3 system is really nice. Interior is really nice. Uh, a lot of room in that one. Um, fourth and fifth were the Sorrento and Santa Fe Sport. Uh, mainly just ride quality. They both have uh, uh, not as good ride quality. Also, uh, noisy powertrain, uh, engine well, noise, they have and stuff the, like that. Uh, they have the turbo. turbo yeah. mm-hmm. And uh, the Santa Fe Sport is on a smaller wheelbase than the Sorento, so the ride was a little choppier on that one. And coming in last, uh, unfortunately, is the Jeep Grand Cherokee. Uh, yeah, again, very nice vehicle. It can out tow and out off road any of those, but neither one of those were part of the judging criteria. So, I guess so I it's a little it. bit of a surprise that the Sorento didn't do better. Um, but I, you know, I have to agree. the uh, The two liter turbo we had, the powertrain, even though it was quite adequate, was a little noisy. And as you remember it, the exhaust was so hot it melted. My car carrier. My, it was noisy. This uh, one, luggage I, carrier on the back. I almost think something was wrong with the one we had because I don't remember it riding as rough. I don't know if it I had super big wheels on it or what, but uh, it was just what, a really rough ride to it. And it was, I thought the one we had for long term was a terrific highway and, Well, cruiser. interesting enough, we just finished up another one of these, a three-row one, which I guess we'll be talking about uh, later. Uh, but between the heavier weight of the V6 and the third row... And I guess it had smaller wheels. I don't know. But it rode totally different than the one we had in the uh, two rows. Well, that is the hot market, that and the compact uh, crossover markets. They're just uh, going like gangbusters while the rest of the car market is uh, sort of in uh, neutral or reverse. I mean, for Ford to actually uh, suspend production of the F-150, you know that something's going on. And the Mustang, too. And the Mustang, too. Big drop there for family mid-size Family sedans, uh, you know, dropping off the cliff. Um, they keep talking about this as a plateau in the car market, but you got to remember the car market usually leads the economy. So uh, 
I don't know. Quick question yeah. mm-hmm. before we jump off. Um, for that kind of money in Murano, do you get all the Nissan safety uh, features like the 360 cam and all their uh, braking mitigation and stuff? Uh, I don't think you got braking. I don't think you had the Altima as far as the safety, but you, do, you did get the uh, round view camera gotcha. and stuff like that. And, and, oh, good. Um, was I noticed uh, just in past that Hyundai, Hyundai and Kia get a lot of tech for a little bit of money. Were uh-huh. they kind of like tech and feature laden more than any of the others? The Santa Fe Sport was. That was the highest trim level you could get with just about every option to be under that price. Um, the Sorento, no, that one was... It was by far the cheapest one there, and uh, it didn't have all the tech packages and all. It had a basic backup camera and the basic Uvo, but not the uh, upgraded system. Cool. Uh, and probably Edge was the sportiest, the sportiest choice. Um, by far, yeah. yeah. It, it it was pretty close between that and the Murano. Like I said, it it's got a lot of room, and Sync Three is way better than it uh, has been. A comfortable car. But uh, the interior is also uh, it's kind of cold compared to the Murano. Hmm. Just all that it's not hard surfaces, but it's just everything's kind of flat and in, industrial looking. Whereas yeah, I do Murano, like Murano's kind of alternate use of alter, alternate materials, like yeah. stuff I, that we haven't really seen before. It's it's I, I think it's, it's actually easily the most attractive to me of of that group. Let me ask you you all a question mm-hmm. since it sort of came up in this test and Ben just mentioned it. If you were out buying uh, a family vehicle like that for your family, would you stretch to get all of the advanced safety features like automatic braking and blind spot protection and all that? Only because yeah. I have a family, I think I would. Right. I think if I didn't have kids, I don't think it would be in my mind as much. Greg? I, you don't have a family well, yet? No, I, no, I don't, but I, um, I, I've seen the systems in use, and they've actually helped me a lot. Not so much braking, like the uh, collision mitigation, uh, but I definitely know I love rear cross traffic alert and, and blind spot. So if I had to go to a package. another package to get those, I think I would definitely do that because they really do work well. Patrick, you're the single guy. What, do you, what would you think? I'm not single. What's up? No, no, I'm, I'm engaged. <laughs> yeah. I'm getting married. Congratulations. <laughs> um, Technically still single, but I guess sure, not. Sure. Whatever you want to call it. I'll see it. a ring on it. Uh, I, yeah, I agree with Greg. I would, uh, I would go for all the stuff just because, like he said, I've used it. Um, I would even go as far as to say the uh, automatic braking, emergency braking, uh, works well. I've had it kick in a couple times. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I've tested it a couple times, but I've also had it actually save me a couple times. So I'd go for it. Brian? Uh, I go back and forth. I'm kind of coming around on all the uh, intrusive uh, safety features, but that brings wow, up that's an a interesting. Mark this uh, day. <laughs> interesting uh, with these comparisons with that price cap. You know, manufacturers have a choice whether they want to send them, you know, fully loaded with the safety mm-hmm. stuff, which is impressive, or put all-wheel drive in there, which to me is much more useful. But it's in not our gonna, area. Certainly. Yeah, uh, driving it around and dry roads all week is not going to earn any extra points. True. So. Uh, yeah, I think if I had to choose between all-wheel drive or all the advanced safety, I would pick all-wheel drive. But and a lot of buyers, unlike us, were familiar with these features. Yeah, they, and it's we new them. to them, and they so, don't yeah. think, why do I need it? So they might not be yeah. – they, they don't know what they're missing. Okay. Let's move on now to um, a little beast that I think we all had been waiting to have some, spend some time in for a long time. <laughs> we have been waiting. The, I mean, I don't know of any sporty car that had been, you know, dangled in front of us longer than the Ford Focus RS. Uh, finally on sale, finally in the testing. Um, you know, just a great little hot rod, but was it really worth all the hype and the wait? Let me open it up. We all had a lot of time in it. What do you think? Yeah. Was it worth Whoa, the wait? Whoa! Didn't, see, didn't jump right in. Well, well that, that was a weird question to lead off. Yeah. Like, was yeah. it worth the wait? I was. Uh, I don't think it was worth the wait. I was a little, t- and the car is awesome. Don't get me wrong. I was hoping it would be a little more daily friendly than it is. And in my short opinion, I feel that it's a car that if you're going to buy it, you have to have intentions on tracking it. Otherwise, huh. otherwise the day to day. Uh, characteristics of the car that to some may be enjoyable just become kind of like it's worth putting up for them if you're ultimately going to track it here and there then it's worth the daily characteristics that i consider maybe to be nuisances 
It's it's definitely hard to live with on a daily basis, and I think the reason it didn't live up to the hype, not even that it didn't live up to the hype, it probably did, but I think because it was dangled in front of us for so long that at least I built this like great car up in my head, and then yeah. when I finally finally drove it, I don't think anything I would have driven would have would been have, as good as I thought it was going to be. As your imagination. But having said that. Um, I drove it on the track for most of the time, and I had a blast because it's one of those cars where there is enough power to make it fast and fun, but it's not so much that you're worried about killing yourself in it mm. because you can pretty much ring this out for everything it has, and you're going to be okay as long as you have some sort of you know track uh, inclination. But, yeah, exactly, and I was just looking for something I could ring out that far or close to that far on the street, and that mm. it definitely isn't that car. Yeah, you're, yeah, you're right, and uh, it's super rough. Uh, the seats are so bolstered that if you're driving normally, or, or like it, it's almost like you have to jump up over them to get in, and you're not moving anywhere. <laughs> Patrick, uh, yeah, any, uh, any? I thought it was. You jump in? Yeah, I mean, I hate to say, I hate to agree with everyone else, but I thought it was awesome, but maybe not worth the well, forty grand. Well, not just the price, but the well, the, yeah, the price is hard yeah. to justify. But the the weight too sort of didn't quite live up to it. But I thought I only daily drove it, and I did not take it out on the track. Mm-hmm. So I thought it was easier to drive than I thought it was going to be. But still, yeah, pretty rough, pretty aggressive, pretty stiff. You um, probably drove it on rougher pavement than the rest yeah, of us. Yeah, taking it just taking it downtown yeah. and hitting potholes. That thing, it is pretty jarring. Um, and we spent a decent amount of time in the Focus ST back when that was brand mm-hmm. new. So, and I thought that was awesome. So. It's hard for me to say definitely get the RS over an ST because I thought the ST was awesome. I didn't think the, street, the ride was that bad. I, mean, I, I have to agree with you. I didn't either. Mm-hmm. I mean, well, but, you know, maybe you and I are used to when Detroit used to crank out stuff that was so rough that your teeth would jar in your yeah. mouth. Well, Did yeah. you spend a lot of time behind the wheel, though? Just street. I didn't drive it on track. Yeah. But, I mean, for the performance that it has, I thought the ride was totally acceptable. Um, I mean, if it didn't you know scream around the track like yeah. it does then i wouldn't want that ride but yeah i didn't think it was that bad at all for for what it is i can i can i can see where if you drove it back and forth to work every day it it might get a little tiring but i i thought the car was a blast i, I guess where i came up against it was it was a lot of money for it for when you think about the other options out there yeah in the domestic area that would give you a little bit more comfort and close to the performance but uh, hmm. i was i found myself comparing it to gti for a much cheaper yeah, and GTI. And I thought that, that was a very – you were the first one to bring that up, and I actually thought that was extremely valid. For the price, there yeah. are other options that are also European that and may – And for my intentions. Yeah. If you're going to be honest with yourself, yeah. I don't want to be a poser that's going to buy a Focus RS and never take it oh, on the track, bro. which, you know, you know that there's guys out there that are going to do that. Mm. And, and, and then you have the Golf R, and does the Golf R do it better? Or do it more civilized? I, I think, it, well, it can, from what I remember, I think it, Because you can get the, the electronically controlled uh, suspension. Right. So you can get it. It's not the base car, but you can get it to be more compli- compliant on the road when you're not tracking it or driving hard. Um, but another note, I think we didn't talk about it, but we'll talk about it in the road test, is just the drift mode that everybody talked mm-hmm. about. Yeah, you know, I tried it on the track, knowing that it probably wouldn't drift for me, and it, and it, it obviously doesn't. You still have to know how to drift. It just sends the proper power to the rear. Right, it just sends the proper power. And we've seen plenty of videos of people who may not have known that and end up in a uh, a, a bit of a problem situation. Hitting the, hitting the <laughs> mountainside. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's pretty awesome. So if you get a Focus RS, just know that it will not drift for you. Well, let me, for let a front-wheel me. drive car, you can have drift time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me t- flip it around then, because it, I think we came off so negative. Did sure. you like the car performance-wise? Did you, did you think that, wow, this is something special? Let me, since I was so negative to start, let me flip it. The power was awesome, uh, not to add more negativity, but I thought the clutch, and it could be just a beat-up tester, but the clutch seemed to grab at an awkward, uh, close-to-the-firewall kind of It was position. a hair-trigger, too. Huh? Hair-trigger clutch, <laughs> and the shifter seemed a little vague at times to me, too. Um, but uh, I, I did feel awesome driving it when, when I felt like driving it awesomely. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a good one. All right. To- Let's move on now for our lightning round. We've got two minutes to debate a trending automotive topic. Um, this one just keeps coming up, so here we go. 
Uh, the latest round of Chevrolet Silverado commercials has um, them bashing the uh, F one hundred and fifty for using aluminum. Uh, they talk about uh, dropping Quite a lot of stuff in the bashing. bed. That was a, I saw uh, that commercial with the yeah, toolbox. It, <laughs> that's the latest one. They did the one with the the big uh, stones, and now it's right. a toolbox piercing the um, the F one hundred and fifty bed. Inevitably, you know, Silverado is the next Silverado is going to have a lot of aluminum in it. We don't know if it's going to be. We don't think it's going to be total aluminum, but. Fuel economy standards are going to force this. I get, the question is, is, is Chevy's marketing very short-sighted? Uh, are they just trying to squeeze every last bit of life out of the current Silverado, which is still selling okay? Mm-hmm. Um, what do you think about this kind of advertising, and is it, is it even realistic? Well, uh, go ahead. I was going to say, as Forrest Gump said, I think maybe both are happening at the same time. Um, I think that <laughs> they are trying to suck every little last bit out of that current Silverado. But I think that they're, they don't understand maybe that we live in the internet age now where all these commercials are going to hang around for a while. And as soon as they make a aluminum truck, people are going to go find those commercials on YouTube and be like, Hey guys, remember when you bashed aluminum years ago? Like you could have maybe gotten away with this 20, 15 years ago, something like that when nobody like recorded commercials and and held them. Every single thing is going to be on the internet now and so easily accessible to anybody who wants to bring that up. And they're going to say, what changed? Well, I mean, all they would have to do is make a composite bed like, um, like well, Ed. that's true. They have they have plenty of composite beds out there. Yeah, well, Honda yeah. took that's Honda not the only commercial either. either. That's right. It. Honda turned around, did the same stuff in their bed, and it fares way better than the Silverado. So, and probably better than yeah than any yeah. metal bed. The but composite. I, bed. I think that in commercials are a little insulting to truck buyers too, yeah. because if you're around environments like that where that could happen, wouldn't you put a liner in or at least a spray mm-hmm. liner? I mean, or who's going to who's going to Ninety percent of trucks on the road have some type of bed liner. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure you can get it. Like it's ridiculous. I think yeah. the commercials are insulting to people in general because yeah. those people may have never seen a car before. <laughs> the, <laughs> they the claim to they not react. know that it looks like a Chevy or anything like that. Like, wow, that is incredible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, any of those that whole Chevy focus group type marketing thing is, you, it's hmm, it gets on my nerves. <laughs> we'll just leave it that way. That might be the it's rant so, after yeah. this. It yeah. might carry over. That was it. Mm. You know, especially since there's just uh, – the truck market is so sectioned. I mean, the number of people out there that don't – that go in not knowing what brand of truck they're going to buy, it's got to be very, very small. It's like the only segment left with that still has brand loyalty for yeah. the most part. So, I mean, what are they doing? Spending all of this money for 5% of the buyers, and even if they got every one of them, it wouldn't push them over the top. I guess it's just all about money since they make so much money selling all these pickup trucks. If they wanted a commercial, it would really hit home. Just have a, somebody trying to put a magnetic sign on a Ford. <laughs> That's Not, a good one. That's the you only can thing. Do it. Yeah, their business That's design. the biggest yeah. disadvantage for me. All right. Thank you, Patrick. You saved us by the bell. Uh, let's talk about a viewer question from Leo. He says, can old fuel be related to a check engine light? We're talking about the orange lights, not the red one. He says his O2 Accord's been sitting for two months. He occasionally starts the car with three-quarters of a tank of regular fuel. Uh, Car needed inspection, but on the way, the check engine light came on. The mechanic says uh, nothing turned up. I'm not so sure you have a very good mechanic. Uh, anyway, he changed the gas cap for 10 bucks. It cleared up the light for about six miles. It's back on again. Before I go back to the mechanic, does it sound logical that it may be old gasoline sitting in the tank and can putting in a higher octane gas solve the problem? Well, it doesn't sound logical. Anything's possible. Uh, anything's possible. We've certainly yeah. had plenty of problems with, with uh, you know, summer gas, uh, if not you know, winter gas. Two months in a tank should not have spoiled the gas to the to that point it could be lots of things it could be something still wrong with the car who and your mechanic probably needs to do a little better job of evaluating it and putting it on a, 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 a tester looking for codes because it does trigger a code yeah it's almost always comes down to a sensor every time there's yeah. a check engine light on a sensor of some sort either the sensor's failing or something in the system is not operating properly but now I, i'll tell you i've got 
uh, a pickup truck, uh, a Ford Ranger, and I've got started off with the gas cap light coming on. That's that, in my truck's old enough they had those, and then I replaced the gas cap, but I knew that wasn't the issue. Now the check engine light is on. Now, when this happened to me before, it turned out to be that uh, a rodent had gotten in and chewed through a wire. Oh. So, uh, you know, they had to drop the tank to find it. But so this problem, Leo, could be lots of things. It could be gas. It could be sensor. As I agree with Brian. It likely is that. It could be a broken wire somewhere. It could be a leak that is uh, in the in the fuel system that's letting the vapors out. And that's more, you know, that could be caused by rust uh, as well as uh, a lot of other issues. Could have been hacked by Russians. Who knows? It could have been hacked by Russians. Yeah. More times than not, it could be O2 sensor. It seems those go out all yeah. left and right. Leo, you need to ask your uh, technician to do uh, a <laughs> thorough uh, code search and then not let him just start replacing parts, but really get into it and see if you can figure out what the problem is before you have to uh, I guess you've already taken in for inspection. You, I guess you'll have to get it solved one way or the other. Uh, yeah, anyway, I, it, it may not be an caps. easy. It may not be an easy. Go six fix. miles at a time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, rant and rave. Anything on anyone's mind this week that has uh, to do with the automotive world? I'm blank. Blank. Yeah, actually, I am too. Last night um, on the um, interstate. I'm really getting annoyed at the people that are out there driving like it's a video game. I mean, it's like most drivers drive fairly sanely. I'm not saying that they don't speed. But then you get the oddball that's out there that really is using the cars in the lanes as bumpers Mm -hmm. on some kind of a, a pinball machine. You know, I look at them, and there's nothing you can do about it because they go, they do this, and then the next exit, they get off. It's like they're not really going anywhere. Um, I wish if the, anyone like that is listening to this, just realize what a what a hazard you are on the road. That's all I've got. To take it a step further, in the last six months, after have, driving the roads that we normally yeah. record on for drive-bys, Last six months, I've noticed that every single one of them has just epic burnout marks. Yeah, on I've there. noticed that too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. Why don't you look in the parking lot of, uh, of where we were? <laughs> well, you know, it's like I looked. All I you now I'm old, so I look down and say, "Well, that's about two hundred dollars worth of rubber sitting there on a pavement." <laughs> so somebody's having a good time, but what I fear is it's going to be at Motor Week's expense because if we get caught out there doing um, just just general filming, people are going to neighbors are going to oh, see yeah. us and assume oh, yeah. that it's us because yeah, probably so because we have access to that kind of car. It's not us. Do that, it's not it's us. We're responsible. Every road, <laughs> huge, epic, swirly burnouts. Yeah. All right, guys, this brings to a close our Motor Week podcast number one hundred. Forty-nine. I want to thank everybody around the table. Brian Robinson, Ben Davis, Greg Carlos, Patrick Lucas, uh, Jim Bigwood, our audio engineer, also our podcast creator, Bob Mixter, and, of course, Patrick for producing today's podcast. If you're out there and you want more Motor Week besides public television, we're also seen on Velocity. Please like us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Lots of stuff on YouTube. Instagram as well. If you've got any kind of electronic (laughs) device that receives information, you can find Motor Week. And we hear from all of you so much. Thank you very, very much for listening and watching (laughs) to Motor Week. (laughs) And we'll be back soon for more Motor Week podcast. And that's it. For Motor Week Central, I'm John Davis. We'll see you soon. You have been listening to the podcast of Motor Week, television's original automotive magazine. Motor Week is made possible by TireRack.com and by RockAuto.com. For additional information on podcasts, videos, and showtimes, visit our website at MotorWeek.org. And watch Motor Week television's longest-running automotive magazine series each week on your local PBS station.